Come everybody. Quick reminder, uh, project two is now out. I know you couldn't wait. And project one is due this Friday. Please, if you haven't gotten started by now, uh, I hope you have gotten started by now. Please start immediately. Um, you have two late days for every project and for the homeworks. Please, everybody, close their laptops. Thank you. Even those who pretend they can't hear me, I can try different languages. Bitte, laptops zu machen und zwar schnell. Danke. All right, thank you. All right, so last time we talked about the perceptron. Last time we talked about the perceptron. Does anyone remember what was the assumption that the perceptron made on the data? Yeah? Oh, not always you. You know everything. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah? That's right. The data is linearly separable. By the way, I mean that in a positive way. Don't, don't, I hope you're not offended. Um, <laughs> Right, so we have our data set crosses and, and zeros. We assume that we have two kinds of labels, minus one and plus one. So let's call this one plus one, this one, you know, these zeros are minus one, and we assume that there exists a hyperplane that separates these two, right? So the hyperplane is just a line in two dimensions, and some plane in higher dimensions. Yes, question? based on how close you were to the hyperplane? Or does this, does that if you, I see, if you don't want to do classification, you want to do regression. That's exactly how you do regression. But there's, there's a little bit more to it, because you can't just use any hyperplane. There's no, because there's no separating hyperplane anymore, if you actually have no classes. Right? But, but yes, there's something along these lines. We will get to this very soon. <clears throat> All right, and the perceptron algorithm is very, very simple. This, this hyperplane is, you know, is, is defined by this vector w. And technically, it's actually, you know, the hyperplane is uh, the set of points, x such that w transpose x plus b equals 0. We can collapse that into just w, x, that's, you know, if you just add one more dimension. So we talked about this last time. And um, so, you know, without loss of generality, we just assume that we, we have no b. And then the algorithm is really, really simple. Right? So you basically, you go through your data points one by one, and you check, do I look at, lie on the right side of the hyperplane? And what do I want? If my label is plus one, then I want, I want w transpose x should be greater than zero. And if I have minus one, I want w transpose x be less than zero. y equals, y equals. So this means I always want y times w transpose x to be uh, greater than zero. Right? So that's... That's the same thing. <clears throat> and that's exactly the condition we are checking. So you go through one data point you know, at a time. The order is actually not important. You check if this condition is satisfied. And if it's satisfied, then you move on to the next point. That means you know, we lie on the right side, so we don't have to do anything. The moment this is not satisfied, so we have a less equal 0 here, then we do an update. And uh, we basically do the following update. If y equals plus 1, then we say w becomes w plus x. If y equals minus 1, then we say w becomes w minus x. And that again translates into w becomes w plus y times x in both cases. <clears throat> All right? <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. Oh, OK. Damn, did anyone hear anything I just said? It says dead battery. All right. Um.
All right, one, two, test, better? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up, better? Yeah, okay, good, awesome, thank you, thanks for letting me know. Luckily, I had batteries with me, it's amazing. <clears throat> okay, good, so what we want to do now is we want to uh, prove that this is actually a reasonable algorithm. That means um, if there exists such a hyperplane, so if there's a single W star that does separate them, then we will also find them. Right, find a W that does. So it doesn't have to be the same one. In fact, if there exists one, there's you know usually infinitely many. Um, but um, we want to show that the, you know that we will converge. That this this update actually will not loop forever, and we will terminate at some point, ideally in a finite number of steps. So not just in the limit, and uh, that the you know whatever we uh, uh, converge to does separate it. Now the one thing is you know well the moment we do stop, we must have found a hyperplane, because that's our stopping condition, right? So we say we loop until basically this is satisfied for every single data point. That means the moment the algorithm stops, we must have found a solution. It could be that we never stop. All right, so let's, let's make sure. The question is like, you know, can we somehow show that this algorithm cannot loop forever? And so last time we basically said, okay, well, let me set, let's set up this proof. Um, we made a few assumptions. So the first assumption, this is how we ended the lecture, was, well, there exists a w, w star, you know, that separates it, such that for, uh, for every x comma y in our data set, we have satisfied that y w star x, you know, there's a transpose, uh, is greater than zero. So we always lie on the right side. Then we made one more step. We said, okay, this is just the assumption of the perceptrons. That's not a big deal. It's just formalized. Um, but the moment there exists one W star, there actually must uh, exist infinitely many. Why is this? Because you can just take W star and multiply by any non-negative number, uh, sorry, uh, 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 any positive number, and this will still be satisfied, right? So if I multiply this here with any constant alpha, where alpha is greater than zero, um, this is still true, right? So I can just define any other W star prime equals alpha times W star, okay? So for any alpha, basically, I can find another hyperplane that has exactly the same property. And essentially what I'm doing, I'm just rescaling this W, right? So I can just make this longer while well, it doesn't change anything, okay? So there's infinitely, if there exists one, there must be infinitely many. And, uh, and in fact, they can have any possible scales. So what we say is very simple. We just pin down one of them and we say W star, the norm of W star equals one. Okay, and we can easily recover this. The moment we have any of them, we just divide, we just set alpha to the one over the norm, right? And then we basically rescale it such that the norm is one. Any questions about the step? So we now basically have, you know, just this W here has exactly norm one, right? So that's my W star here. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first step uh, that we did. And then we kind of went a little bit further and we said, well, actually, we can't just, we don't just have to do this for x. Uh, for w, we can also do it for x, right? The same thing. We can also multiply x by alpha and nothing changes. So we can also rescale all our data as long as we rescale every single data point by the same scalar. Um, and it has to be uh, positive. So we can do exactly the same trick. And basically what we, we assume that, you know, xi, the norm of xi is less equal 1 for all i. <clears throat> so essentially what we're doing is we divide every x by the norm of the, of the point with the largest norm, so the largest possible norm. Any questions about this? Raise your hand if you're okay with these two steps. Okay, not everybody. Um, any questions about it? So let, the geometric intuition was the following. We have our data data like this, and what we are basically doing is we are rescaling the scale of this such that the entire data set falls into a circle of unit one, uh, of radius one. So some data point is going to lie right here on the edge. That's the one that's furthest away, at least one. And our W vector is going to go exactly from zero. Let me make this a little prettier here. This here is my zero. My w vector has exactly norm one, right? So it will also, the w vector will also go to here, right? And once I found this, I can rescale the whole thing again to my original data set. Data set. Yeah? Is the reason that the hyperplane will still be the same 
happen after it's killing all the food is that it because it passes through the wall? Like it always passes through the wall? Um, that just certainly makes it easier. You could also do it otherwise, but yes, this way you just multiply by a scalar, right? So I don't know if you've seen the movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Have you seen this? It's a little like this. You just shrink everything, and then you can make it big again. Yeah? Uh, how can we be guaranteed that the, shrink, the rescaling doesn't change the classification of any of the boards? Oh, because you shrink everything by the same amount. The entire world gets shrunk. Right? You shrink everything. Right? So if you shrink everything, then the relation between any two points is the same. So we shrink everything, find the hyperplane, and then we unshrink it again. <clears throat> okay, any more questions? Uh, yeah. Um, are you rescaling the points the same? No, so these can be rescaled independently, actually. Right? Because W actually has this additional property that actually you know, any, any rescaling of W will still be a separating hyperplane because it goes to the origin. Yeah, all the X, you shrink all the X's, and then you can still actually shrink the hyperplane anyway without changing, changing its orientation. That's exactly right, right? So you basically say X becomes X, XI becomes XI divided by the, the maximum norm of any point. Right? So therefore, the largest one has exactly norm 1. <clears throat> Any more questions? OK, so if you buy this, which you should, then we can move ahead. Who managed to look at the proof before this lecture? Raise your hand. <laughs> well, there are some. <laughs> some. <laughs> All right, congratulations to you guys. <laughs> All right, so, so here's the idea. What we want to show is that we know there's this vector w star. It starts from 0. Here's the origin, this W star, and we, we initially we have, you know, some like this uh, W, and then basically we, we keep updating this W. And the first thing we want to show is that W becomes closer and closer to W star. Right? So, you know, if you could show that basically W becomes more and more similar to W star, well, then you could actually make an argument eventually it's the same as W star. That's kind of one, one way of looking at it. And so what we will look into is the quantity, what happens to W transpose W star after an update? Okay, so when we make an update to our W vector, how does W change in relation to W star? Okay, that's the first thing we look at. And what we will show is that that will actually always become larger. So every time you make an update, this quantity will become larger. Now, that's good, but it's not enough. Why is it not enough? How could you make this? trivially larger without actually getting closer to W star. Any ideas? So I'm showing you every time I update W, this becomes larger. That's good. That seems to suggest that these two vectors become more similar. The inner product measures the alignment, like how, you know, how close they are. But actually, it's not enough. So it, it, there could be a pathological case where basically this becomes larger with every single update, yet we're not getting any closer. I saw you. <laughs> I give you. I give you three answers per lecture. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah. That's right. So you could just rescale uh, W, right? So basically, you know, one option could be that you know, imagine you could just every time you just update you, uh, you update W by a factor two or something, right? Then this here always becomes larger by a factor two, but actually the, the relative relation between these two hasn't changed at all, right? So the first time W is this, the next time W is twice as long, and then four times as long, right? And we haven't actually made any progress. Our hyperplane hasn't changed at all, right? Um, and so for that, we look at the quantity W transpose W. How does that change, right? And so in the case that you just pointed out, what would happen, this would grow really fast, but this would also grow really fast. So really just the norm of W would become really, really large. And what we can show is that this here grows fast, and this it does not grow very fast. And then we can actually prove 
put these two results together and say, if that's the case, if w becomes more and more, you know, the inner product between w and w star becomes larger, yet we can show that it's not the case that w is just growing, then the only option that we have left is that w tilts towards w star, and eventually they define the same hyperplane. Any questions about the high level intuition? All right, so let's get cracking. <clears throat> All right, so let's first look at, you know, when we do an update, what happens? An update does the following. By the way, please pay attention now. It's so much easier to follow it now in lecture. Like, it, it, this is definitely on the exam, right? So this is kind of such a beautiful little proof. So <clears throat> it's irresistible. <clears throat> um, these are resistible. Wait, what the hell? OK, here we go. <laughs> All right, OK, this is what I wanted. So when we do an update, w becomes, becomes w plus y times x. OK? That's the first thing we have to note. The second thing we have to note is that the only reason we didn't update was because we misclassified x. Right? So what do we know, therefore? We know that y w transpose x must be less equal to 0. Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have done the update. OK? Raise your hand if you're with me at this point. OK, awesome. Right? So we know these two things. So we're making, we know this about x and y and w. And we're making this, we're doing this step. Right? w becomes this. And the first thing you want to now look at is if we make this update, how does that affect these two terms, right? And I think I started with W transpose W stars. Let's do this one first. <coughs> so the first question is how does that affect W, w transpose stars, or how does it affect our relationship of W, uh, uh, our weight vector, with the the holy grail uh, weight vector that we, that we know actually separates the data. And so, well, what we do is we just substitute the new, our new w in here, right? So we now know this, what does it become? This term now changes, right? And in which way does it change? We now have w plus y times x in here, transpose w star. Okay, that's, that's basically, that's the change that happens. Raise your hand if you're with me. Okay, there's going to be a lot of raising your hands, but you know, uh, I just want to make sure I don't, I don't lose you guys. All right, good. So that's great. So now we can take this apart, right? Uh, and say, well, that's the same thing as pulling this in here and pulling it in here. So we have W transpose W star plus Y times uh, W transpose star X. Okay, now without looking at the notes, what do we know about this term. And now be careful, this is a star. This is not W, this is a star. So this is not our original W, this is the W star that we basically want to find. Someone said it, yeah? Uh -huh. It's positive, why is it positive? That's right, right? So this here is kind of, you know, this here is the golden boy here, right? So this guy gets everything right, right? So this means the only way that's possible is if this term here is always positive, okay? So this is greater than zero, right? <clears throat> um, all right, where am I? So the, okay, so then, um, oh shoot, sorry, I forgot one thing. Oh, sorry, guys. I forgot one. I try to be really quick here. Sorry. One, one quick, one quick note that I uh, one thing I forgot to define is the margin. Okay, good. So, what is the margin? We will need the margin. So, the margin is. Remember, we have our data points x's. And we have our O's. <clears throat> well, there's some point that's closest to the hyperplane. 
right? There must be some of them. Like, let's say this guy here is the closest to the hyperplane, right? <clears throat> Everybody's on the right side, but one of them is going to be closest, right? Could be the two are actually equally close, right? That's fine. Let's pick one of them. Uh, we can find gamma to be the, we call this the margin, basically, in some sense, the distance to the hyperplane, right? And because everything is norm one, it actually turns out it's just uh, the minimum in a product with the hyperplane. So x transpose w star for x comma y element of d. <clears throat> so this is just a constant, and we, we will need it uh, in the proof. So the important thing is, like, this is, is, this is greater than zero, right? <laughs> it's not greater equals zero. <clears throat> Uh, the margin is actually something we will use throughout a machine learning. Whenever we define hyperplanes, uh, one thing you want to think about is, you know, how large is that margin? Right? <clears throat> can I give you an intuition? Like, what do you want? Like, you know, let's say I can find a hyperplane. You know, I have two hyperplanes. One is a very small margin, one is a very large margin. Which one would I prefer? Because it does not matter. Any ideas? <clears throat> Yeah. That's exactly right, right? So, so the intuition used to be is if you have a small margin, right, like basically you would carve a hyperplane right here. Then if you get a test point that's just a little different from this point, then it could be on the wrong side of the hyperplane. So typically a large margin is desirable in machine learning. Right? So we will get into this. There's actually a whole family of large margin classifiers. But <clears throat> for now, there's like, you know, just this Think about this notion, and this is actually, this is why I put this on the placement exam, you remember, computing the distance to a data point. You know, the margin basically says, how close are we? Uh, what's the distance to the closest point in our data set? Okay, good. <clears throat> All right. So, so now we know this is greater uh, than zero. And in fact, we know even more, right? If you look at W transpose X, well, that's exactly what this thing is. Right? And we know that gamma is the smallest such term. So gamma is the smallest inner product with the, with the uh, W star. So we know that this must, in fact, be greater than gamma. OK, does that make sense? So this is basically, essentially what this is, is the distance of x from this hyperplane W star. And we know the minimum is gamma, so it must be greater than gamma, right? or greater equal gamma. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions? And so that means what we can do is we can say this is greater or equal than W transpose W star plus gamma. So why is that important? So what have we just shown? We've just shown that if we make an update, the inner product of the hyperplane that we're looking for with the hyperplane that we want to find grows by gamma, at least by gamma. It may grow more, right? But every time we make an update, this quantity increases by at least gamma, right? Because what we showed is that basically this, the updated quantity is greater or equal than the old quantity plus gamma. Okay? Any questions? Raise your hand if that makes sense. OK, awesome. OK, this is a big deal, by the way. Right? Because we're showing, it, it's not that actually, it, like one thing that would be bad if it kind of increases a little bit, and you know, increases less and less and less as we keep going. Right? No, the beautiful, beautiful thing is, we actually have a concrete number, and we say it will grow at least that much every single step. Right? <clears throat> so that's, that's a very powerful statement. All right. So here comes the second one. What happens with W transpose W? All right? So that was the second thing we were concerned about. <laughs> and well, what do we do? We do exactly the same trick. We plug in, we, now we do an update. So this you know, becomes the following, right? Um, we plug in the new definition of W in here. So now we get W plus Y times X transpose W plus Y times X. Okay, so all I did is I take W transpose W. So what's the squared norm of my hyperplane? 
And for each w, I put in the new w. So that's the new expression here. All right, so I, in, once again, I expand this. So this becomes w transpose w plus you know, 2 times y w transpose x plus y squared times x transpose x. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at this. This is good, right? This here is again the old term plus some stuff, right? It's exactly what we had here, right? We basically said, you know, when we update this, we get the old term plus some stuff, and the stuff turned out to be at least gamma. So the question is, what is the stuff here, right, in this case? So we have W transpose W, and now we can look at these terms here, and then let's see what we can figure out about it, right? So the first question is, what do we know about why W transpose X. Any ideas without looking at the notes? What is, what is this? It's... I don't know if someone, someone said it. Yeah. Uh, what is this term? Yeah. It's negative. Right? Why is it negative? That's right. Right? So W transpose X... Uh, so th the reason we made an update is because x was on the wrong side of the hyperplane, and we only, that means w, y, uh, w transpose x must be negative. Right? That's the test for our, if you do an update or not. Right? So we know this is less than 0. All right, good. And uh, second step is y squared. What do we know about y squared? Right? It's 1. Yeah. So it's, it's 1. And what do we know about x transpose x? That's right. Let's equal 1. Right? How do we know this? That's right, right? We, 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 we made it that way, right? So we kind of, you know, now we know why we did it. All right, good. <clears throat> so now, if we know these things, well, we can actually plug these numbers in, right? And we can actually say, well, that is um, less equal than W transpose W, this term here. <clears throat> Sorry, one second. Plus one. All right? Okay, good. So, um, Uh, wait, this is correct? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So this here is basically, okay, this here is less equal 1, and this here we can, we can only make this smaller if we basically, we can only make it larger if we drop it, right? So we can just drop it, and then we have less than W transpose W plus 1. All right, any questions? Raise your hand if that makes sense, the last step makes sense. All right, good, good, good. All right, good. <clears throat> so, Here's basically what we did, right? We said we have a lower bound. We're saying this one here changes at least by gamma every time. This point here, uh, the, the inner product with itself, the squared norm, changes at most by one every time. Okay, so we have a lower bound of one, upper bound of the other. And now we basically, what we want to do is we kind of, you know, one kind of grows, grows at a certain speed, the other one grows, can't grow faster than an upper uh, bound on the speed. And we hope that basically they converge at some point, and we can see that that must converge in a, in a finite number of steps. Right? So that a finite number of steps, basically, this can only go on for so long, right, if this is true. That's basically the idea. And um, let me move this up so that you can keep these two inequalities. All right, who is ready to move on? All right, good stuff. <clears throat> so let's say we make M updates, right? So we've run the algorithm, and we're still running, and we've made M updates. So after M updates. This is now in a, like in a TV show, you know? We say like 10 years later or something, right? Like M updates later. <clears throat> and here's what we say. Well. We say m times gamma. Wait, do I have the same? Let me make sure. Yeah. So m times gamma is less equal than w transpose w star. 
Why is that true? <clears throat> yeah. Wait, we have to be careful. W transpose W star. You're almost right. Yeah. So that's right. So the first thing is W starts from zero. So initially it's zero, right? And we've seen up here that W transpose W star grows at least by gamma every time, right? So after M updates, it must be at least M times gamma, OK? So W transpose W star must be greater or equal M times gamma, OK? Because every one of our M updates made this quantity uh, larger by, a fa uh, by, by, by an additive uh, term of gamma. OK, does it make sense? Raise your hand if that makes sense. OK, awesome. OK? So one more time, W transpose W star is the inner product with the hyperplane that we want to have. We so every single update, it increases by gamma. Now we've made m updates, so it must be at least m times gamma. All right, good. So now we can say, um, I'll try to go really, really slowly through this. So that equals um, the absolute value. That's easy, actually, because it's not negative. Right? So you can just pick the absolute value around it. Why not? Right? Uh, but what we can now do is the following. We can say, well, that equals less equal than the norm of W times the norm of W star. Um, does anyone know what that inequality is? Without looking at the notes, anyone know it? Cauchy-Schwarz, right? So that's Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay, good. So you have to, that's one inequality, that's going to be one of five inequalities in computer science that you should know, know about. So if you don't know this one, please look it up. <sighs> it basically says exactly this. If you have two vectors, w and w star, you know, a or b, <clears throat> then actually, basically, their inner product must be less equal than the norms uh, multiplied. <clears throat> it's actually, it's, it's very, fairly easy to prove. Okay, who is with me? Raise your hand. All right, awesome. Good. We're only a few steps away. It's so close. <clears throat> okay, what do we know about W? Uh, sorry, what do we know about W star? The norm of W star? It's one, right? This is one. So you can just drop it, right? So this is W. This is the norm of W. Okay, good. So this equals the square root of W transpose W. Why is that? It's the norm, that's right. <laughs> it's the definition of the norm, right? So that's, you know, that's just what it is. Uh, and now comes the last step. So W transpose W. Wait a second, what do we know about W transpose W? We've done M updates. We just showed something about W transpose W, right? That's like some, some vague recollection, right? Just 10 minutes ago, we showed that W transpose W grows by at most one every time, okay? So this here can be at most M, right? Because we've made M updates. Okay, does that make sense? So this must be less equal to the square root of m. Okay? Raise your hand if you're still with me. All right, good, good, good. Awesome. So close. So now, we've showed something. We showed that m times gamma is less equal than the square root of m. So that actually is very interesting. Because m is the number of updates we made. And we showed an inequality, we basically proved an inequality about this. m times gamma is less equal than square root of m. Well, we can now solve this for, gamma, uh, for m. We can square both sides. We get m squared gamma is less equal m. Sorry? Oh, sorry, gamma squared. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good point. Um, or you can, whatever, you can divide both sides, but actually, maybe you divide both sides by, by square root m. That's actually uh, uh, better. You actually get square root of m, gamma is less equal 1. So, you know, if you now flip it around, you have basically you have 1 over gamma squared. m is less equal 1 over gamma squared. Now, I claim you're done. 
Why are we done? Why is this a big deal? This result made Rosenblatt famous. Yeah? That's right. So early on we said, well, after M updates, right? And the moment I said this, you could prove, wait a second, M can't be larger than 1 over gamma squared. So you can't make more than that many mistakes. Well, gamma is some value, whatever it is. Let's say it's 0.1, right? <clears throat> well, if it's 0.1, right, you know, uh, what you get tends to, you know, 100 updates, right? That's it. After that, you're done. <clears throat> so that's an extremely strong result. It right? basically shows that the algorithm converges in a finite number of steps. And the number of steps only depends on how far away, you know, W star is from, uh, from the closest data point. Now, first, any questions? Any questions about this last step? Raise your hand if you, you think you got it. All right, awesome. So I have one question. There's not just one W star, there could be many W stars. <coughs> Which one would you pick? Yeah? Um, I think the one that would end up giving me the largest gamma. That's right, right? The one with the largest margin, right? So it basically says, the perceptron converges, like, you know, if you take any possible hyperplane, right, you can choose any W star you want, right? Take any possible hyperplane, if you take the one that has the largest margin, right, so that's basically right in the middle, in this case, actually, what is the optimal hyperplane, right? It's not this one. It'd be probably something like this, right? Here's my X, here's my O, right? You probably want to have something like this. Uh, like this, right? It has maximum distance to both data sets. So the, uh, uh, both classes, okay? And if you take that hyperplane and you measure how close you are, uh, uh, what the margin is, right, that basically bounds how many steps you need. Or in other words, if your data set is really very well separable, so data points are really far away from each other, that means you can place a hyperplane with a large margin. That means you will converge very quickly. Whereas on the other hand, if your data set looks like this, so if your X is, right, and the X's and O's, they're kind of hanging out, right? They're like, like this, right? They're really, really close together, right? That means the hyperplane here has a tiny margin, right? It has to be right. That actually will take a very long time, right? Which intuitively makes sense because you have to wiggle it right into between these two, uh, two sets. Yes, question? So, that doesn't imply that when you run the algorithm, you will find that hyperplane. No, it doesn't. You find a hyperplane. That's basically the only guarantee you have. So it could be that this really awesome hyperplane exists, and the one you find is this. Yeah. Right? That's correct. And so what we will do very soon, we will talk about support vector machines, which will actually find exactly this hyperplane. So that's you know, a slightly different optimization procedure. Right? <clears throat> but it was invented 20 years or 30 years later. Yeah. Any, but it's a good question. Any more questions? Yeah. That's, that's right. So, so for a maximum margin hyperplane, you will always have the same margin on both sides, right? If you didn't, if one was further away, then you could always move the hyperplane a little bit in the middle and actually get a better margin. Yes. Yeah? Um, so this is your question, what if you didn't do res rescaling? Yeah. If you didn't do rescaling, essentially the same thing holds, right? Because you could do, if you just rescale the data set, you're just rescaling all the updates, actually everything still works out. That's right, there would be some constancy, yeah, that depends on, that's right, that's right. Yeah. I guess it's the maximum, it's the norm of the maximum data. Yeah. 
Ya. Um, well, that's, yeah, I mean, all I'm saying is that you can have most of M steps. After that, basically, this inequality can't hold anymore. That's basically what it means. Like, you know, these two inequalities uh, can't hold for longer than that many steps. These two, that the uh, W transpose W grows by at most one. Right, so the, you know, uh, the implication here basically tells you, gives you an upper bound of how what W W star is and what, uh, um, and what, uh, what uh, W squared is. So, so think about the following. You basically have a function of W transpose W must grow at least a certain rate, right? It's actually W transpose W grows by, you know, uh, so W transpose W must be less equal than this, must be in this region, right? And uh, W transpose W star must be greater than some other function, right? Must be, you know, greater than, than gamma or something, right? And for these two to hold, I guess, you know, so what, what we basically did here is we basically said, um, uh, sorry, let me just... Yeah, so, so I guess, um, let me just think about the intuition here. So the, I guess you have, you have uh, gamma times m and 1 times m. Ah, sorry, you know what, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't figure the intuition out right now on, on the fly. But <laughs> essentially what you're doing is you have an upper bound and a lower bound to meet up at some point. Yeah. So yeah, I had one of you. <laughs> yeah. So so that's that's a good question, right? So you're basically saying. We assume that W star exists. What if it doesn't exist, right? So the, the cheeky answer is you run the perception algorithm, you wait two days, and if it hasn't converged, then you know it didn't exist, probably. <laughs> um, there, there's a better way. So once we learn the, uh, the uh, SVM algorithm, you can actually solve for this uh, exactly. And you basically can write it as an optimization problem, and this optimization problem has no feasible solution. So you can test for that very easily, yeah. Uh, sorry, there was someone else first, yeah? Ah, sorry, I can't understand your question. It does not guarantee conversions. If W star does not exist, then you have no conversions. Then, then it will always converge, yeah, after that many steps. Right? It must. Because it can only have that many updates. So this means it must converge. Basically, after this, after this many updates, you can't make a mistake anymore. Yeah? Um, well, if gamma is really, really big, right, then this actually, yeah, um, then that's actually not a bad thing, right? It actually means you can converge much faster. I don't know who asked the question. Someone, uh, yeah. So the perception works better in high dimensional data. Yeah, that's absolutely right. In low dimensional data, actually, it's unlikely that you can find a hyperplane that separates. Classes. Okay, maybe last question. Yeah. So it uh, depends on the scale of the data. So I'm not sure if that's true. So it really depends on the separability of the data. All right, that's that's really the case. Does that, does that make sense? So I forgot who asked the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, if, if the data is, like, has a dimension that is larger than something, uh, than other dimensions or something like that, when you actually scale it down at the beginning of the proof, you might actually make the scale of the hyperplane actually be smaller. 
Well, so, so I guess I so understand what you're saying. So you're basically saying if your data set is really, really large, really had really large scale. So the thing you have to, at the beginning, you have to scale it down to this unit circle. So they have to scale down a lot, and therefore they're going to be really close together. But that actually doesn't, that's not really true, right? You could have data points that are really, really large scale, but really far away from each other. And I scale them down to the unit circle, and then you have some points here and some point here, right? So I, I, maybe I scaled them down by a factor of a billion, right, to get here. It doesn't matter. The margin is huge, right? It's really about how close together are the points of different labels. That's, that's really what it is. OK. Um, all right, so we actually won't have time for the next topic. But, but let me just tell you a little story, so the, um, a little bit of history of this. So when the perceptron came out in 1957, it made a huge splash. Right? This was gigantic. This was all over the news. It was considered the first time that people, this was, by the way, neuron inspired. Like, it seems a little weird right now because it's a hyperplane. Right? But the idea basically is that you know, what a neuron basically you know, either fires or doesn't fire, and so that's either positive or negative, and you take all its inputs, you basically take a linear sum of the inputs. So that, that was kind of the idea where, where this came from. And so this was celebrated as the first nerve cell, or the first artificial neuron. Right? And the newspapers were full of it. Like, you know, everybody was reporting about this. Um, and it led to a huge AI boom. I even got an article about, uh, that I linked to from, from the webpage in the New Yorker from 1958 that actually discussed the perceptron. And it talked about everything there is. Like, you know, remember, it ends with this beautiful sentence saying, but what is the, cap what is the perceptron not capable of? Right? Will it ever understand love or human sex drive? And <laughs> to this day, I'm confused about what the you know, author was confused about. There's something, it's clearly something he's not getting. But um, you know, either about the perceptron or about you know, something else. The, but, but the important thing is it was really just a hyperplane. And it took a couple of years for this to catch on. And Marvin Minsky, actually, then famously had a book <clears throat> which he actually called the perceptron. So he actually wanted to write a book about it and show how awesome it is. But he showed his limitations. And he showed this very, very simple data set where he said, well, here's a data set that a perceptron can never learn. Right? You have a positive point here and negative points here. Right? It's called the XOR problem. And this is a data set with four data points, and there's no hyperplane that separates the circles from the axis. Right? And it was not mean-spirited. It was really just, right, you know, Clearly, that's a limitation of this assumption that things are literally separable. But when people read this, they were like, wait a second, it can't, it can't distinguish this? Right? I thought I'm going to have like, armies of robots. Right? Like, you know, I want to have my next husband should be a robot or something. You know? <clears throat> and people got so disillusioned that actually the entire funding for AI dried up. So I talked about this in the, first, uh, in the very first lecture. This was the, death of, uh, the first death of AI. Right? When people realized, you know, at the beginning, they heard, oh, well, there's an artificial neuron, or very soon we will be able to build brains, and they are going to be artificial, they're going to outsmart us. And, you know, people already talked about, what do we do? Do we have to have laws against this? And then basically, there came this very, very simple example and say, well, we can never solve this one with a perceptron, right? And it was such a disillusionment that AI basically died. <clears throat> and people stopped working on AI, and people started working on machine learning. And <clears throat> that's what we, you know, continue with next, next lecture. <clears throat>